It's Wednesday night, and we're in our study. We're studying through the Old Testament. We have, we have gone through Genesis. Genesis took us from the beginning, there in chapter 1, the creation of Adam and Eve in chapter 2. Eve eating of the forbidden tree in chapter 3, giving to Adam, being driven from the garden in chapter 3. Chapter 4, Cain kills Abel, and God has another son. Adam has another son through Eve in the place of Abel, whom Cain slew. That's Seth. Then you get into the fifth chapter, and you get into God's lineage. God's family starts in chapter 5 of Genesis. It starts with Adam having a son. His name is Seth. Seth takes Abel's place. And then Seth has a son, Enosh. And Enosh has a son, Can and Mahalalel. And then on down to Jared. And uh, then down to Enoch. And to Methuselah and Lamech. These are all father, son, father, son, father, son, father, son, father, son. These are all one family. Lamech and then Noah. And Noah has a son. Shem. Now, Shem is second born. He receives the blessing from God just like the second birth receives the blessing from God. We've gone through that various times. Jacob was second born. Ephraim was second born, received the inheritance of Israel. And Abel was second born. And Shem has a son of Faxon, and it takes you down in Genesis 11. This is Genesis 5, 5. And Genesis 11 takes you and it continues in this bloodline. If you want to read it, you can see that it takes you to God's family. And it, it goes all the way down. Uh, it gives you Arphaxid, then Salah, and then Eber, Peleg, and Reu. Uh, gives you Salah, Arphaxid, Salah, then Eber, Eber, Peleg, and Reu. And then it takes you, that's in, that's in verses 10 down through 18. And Peleg has a son named Serug. And Serug has a son, and his name is Nahor. And Nahor is Abraham's grandfather. And then Terah, that's the father of Abraham. And then you have Abraham's father was Terah. And then you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And Jacob's name is changed to Israel. And Jacob has 12 sons. These guys right here. 12 sons become the nation of Israel. The firstborn is rejected. He is unstable as water. That's what the scripture says. Of course, if he's unstable, God made him unstable. And that's Reuben. So God takes the inheritance that belonged to Reuben and gives it to Joseph, the 11th son, through his second-born son Ephraim there in Genesis 48. When he lays his right hand upon the head, when Jacob lays his right hand upon the head of Ephraim and transfers the blessing of the covenant, to Ephraim, and Ephraim heads the ten northern tribes, ten tribes in the north, and that's northern Israel, or it's called Samaria. Uh, it's got many other names, Joseph, Ephraim, or Samaria, or Israel after the kingdom is split. And then you have Judah, out of Judah will come the king, out of Judah comes David and Jesus in that first chapter of Matthew. Well, what we're talking about is Levi. Levi's the third born. Usually the first born would have the inheritance. He would be the king and he would be the priest. But God divided his what was rightfully his because of his instability. He gave it to Levi, Judah, and Joseph through his son Ephraim. Now what we're talking about is we're talking about the Levites. Levi 
when you see the word Leviticus. It means the law of the Levites. When you know somebody, there used to be a, a store down, down here called Levies. Well, the Jews would pronounce this Levy. That's the way they'd pronounce it. And they bring it to the English language and they pronounce it Levy. So if you, and there was a gangster, uh, a mob gangster back uh, in New York back in the 30s, and his name was Levy. He was a Jewish mobster. And uh, these were, that's the word, Levi. We, Mary and I used to have some levies that lived behind us. And I asked the lady, she didn't know anything about God or the Bible or Jews, and she was trying to brag to me one day. She was always a braggart. She said, we are of the tribe of Solomon. <laughs> I just dropped my head. I said, you are. Okay. I didn't want to say there's no such thing as the tribe of Solomon. <laughs> it's funny. She was kind of a big talker and liked to brag and boast, so she had to tell me what tribe she's in. Nobody knows what tribe they're in today. But anyway, so much for that. Well, Levi has, has these three sons. Oops, I didn't. Mareri, or Marari, however you want to pronounce it. Now, a lot of people get on to me, you don't pronounce these Hebrew words right. If we were pronouncing them right, we'd be going, <laughs> we'd be spitting half the time. They had those guttural sounds. Nobody's pronouncing them right. The E is usually, put, the I is usually pronounced like an E. But I say Marari so you can see what it looks like. We're not worried about getting the exact pronunciation of the Hebrew or the Greek words, as long as you understand what it's talking about. That's what we want. Then you have Gershon, Mareri, Gershon. The one we're talking about is Koath. Now, the Koathites had real important jobs. The, you'll find this lineage of Levi in Exodus, the sixth chapter. You'll find all of these men named like so. Well, Koath has four sons. He has Amram, Uziel, Izhar, and Hebron. Now, we, what we're doing is we're continuing last week's study because we're by no means through with the last week's study. This is a continuation. Now, Amram has three children. He has Moses, his older brother Aaron, who is three years older than Moses. Moses is second born son. There's another second born. Getting the blessing of being the leader of Israel. They have an older sister named Miriam. Miriam and Aaron at one point got in trouble with God. They got upset because Moses was married to a black woman in Ethiopia. And God says, I'll kill you for questioning my servant Moses. I'm the one that put these two together. Then, we found out last week in Numbers, the 16th chapter, and throughout other scriptures, that in order to do work in the temple of God, to do a work in the temple, here's the veil, here is the table of showbread, the seven candlesticks, the altar of incense, and we don't know exactly how those were built. Nobody has a record of it. All of this was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. in that 36th chapter of Second Chronicles and in the 25th chapter of Second Kings. So when all of this was destroyed and carried away, he carried away the Ark of the Covenant. We haven't seen it since until Indiana Jones found it. Well, you had four pieces of furniture inside the tabernacle and you had two on the outside. The difference in these was how they were made. These were made inside. They were, they were made of wood and then they were covered with beaten gold. So this Ark of the Covenant was covered with beaten gold 
the altar of incense beaten gold, table of showbread beaten gold, and this candlesticks was a beaten gold. Now, we're going to find, as we study this, that all of this represents the New Testament church, church, our spiritual Israel, our spiritual Jews of the heart, of the heart, and we're the temple of God. We're God's house. That was the inner sanctuary. The house of God. Christ is the son of his own house. Whose house are we? He dwelt between the cherubim. We're going to cover some of that tonight. Dwelt between the cherubim. That means to build a house, to marry. God was married to Israel, and he, and he came down out of the cloud, cloud by day and a fire by night, as it shows in that picture, and he sat down upon the mercy seat and instructed Israel from the mercy seat. And that was Jesus before he was called Jesus. It was Jesus pre-incarnate. We're not going to go through that right now. Now, we've talked about how all of this is a shadow Hebrews 10 and 1 says, The law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image. The image, the icon, is what actually represents Christ. And that's us. We are this temple. We offer acceptable sacrifice. These two pieces of furniture out here, this is the altar. All animal sacrifices were offered on that that was a brazen altar. Some call it brass. I've done some study on it. Some say that it was copper or, or copper and brass. We're not really sure. And then this was the sea. Originally it started off as a laver, but Israel kept growing to such a degree that in the seventh chapter of 1 Kings, when God tells Solomon to build the temple after the same pattern as the tabernacle, he said, build a sea that will hold 3,000 baths because that's where the priests have to wash every morning and they had all these utensils. They had all this garb. The high priest had to wear an ephod that had uh, 12 stones in it and each stone had a rep was a representation for one of the 12 tribes of Israel. That's why we had 12 apostles. Now... What, where we are, we have come through Genesis. We've come from uh, the beginning, through the flood, through the flood, that's from 6 through 9. Chapter 10 tells us where all of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, where they migrated to. Japheth, he migrated up here between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, and this is the Caucasus Mountains, so the Caucasian race coming from up here. Caucasus, we get the word gog. They just simply harden the ka, the K-O-H, ka, kus. They harden the consonants to get gog. So the land of gog and magog is actually the Caucasus mountains up here. That's historical fact between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. The descendants, they landed, when they come out of the ark, they landed in in eastern Turkey, the mountains of Ararat, it's not one mountain, it's a mountain chain. The mountains of Ararat are here in eastern Turkey. That's where they landed. The descendants of, of, of Ham came down into Put, P-U-T, which is part of Egypt, in Ethiopia. This is where the black race comes from. Now, people aren't black because they're lesser, they're black because I believe the same thing that sociologists believe. God makes men different shades of color to adapt to the climate that they're in. A black man can handle the heat better than the white man can. A white man can handle the cold better than black because he has a layer of, of uh, some fatty tissue under his skin. Now, they settled here. Shem's descendants came down here and settled in the land of Haran or the land of what we call Iraq or it was Babylon. 
This is why God had to call Abraham, who was the descendant of Shem, in that lineage that I showed you over here, he had to call Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and give him the land of Israel. Now, we have to become Semitic people of the heart. We have to become Shemites, all of us, whether we're black or white. We have to be spiritual Israel, spiritual Jews. And this is what we become, is we become spiritual descendants of Abraham, of Shem through Abraham, and we're children of Abraham by faith there in Galatians, the third chapter. Now, where we came to after, after this 10th chapter, we got the 11th chapter, that's where Abraham is introduced. That's where Babylon started at the first of the chapter. At the end of the chapter, Abraham comes on the scene. That's kind of amazing to me. Same chapter. Then Isaac and then Jacob. And then, of course, we know the story. Jacob's deception in his life, stealing his brother's birthright. And then Jacob runs over to the land of Haran, has 11 of his sons, comes back to what becomes Israel later because he is Israel. And when he comes back, they have another son, Benjamin, the last born son there in Bethlehem. And then his, he begins to raise his children. In the 37th chapter, Joseph comes on the scene. His brothers are jealous of him because his father favors him above them. And he's sold into Egypt. And then we have the story of his brothers going to Egypt during the famine. And then the trick he pulls on them with his younger brother Benjamin, putting his cup into his sack. And Joseph calls his brothers over here to Egypt. They're there for 400 years. And then Moses comes along in Exodus, the second chapter, and God calls him in the third chapter out of a burning bush and says, I want you to lead my people out of Egypt and take them back to the land that I've given to Abraham. They're, he's sold over here into Egypt. I want you to bring them back, take them through the wilderness, and we're in that wilderness experience over in the 25th chapter of Exodus. Let's go back there. Now, what we're doing, you say, Jim, why do you review this? I don't believe you get it the first time around. If you do, you got more than I did the first time around. It took me 500 times around to get just a general view of the Scripture. And I've read these verses thousands of times, trying to look at them and see how they come together. Now, where we are is in the 25th chapter. Now, they got to Mount Sinai in the 18th chapter, the 19th chapter. Moses goes up on the Mount Sinai. This is all in Exodus. And then in the 20th chapter, he comes down with the Ten Commandments. And then, then in the 21st chapter, God begins to give instruction, daily instruction about if an ox falls in a ditch or if you kill a man accidentally or if you kill a man intentionally and you have to die for it and so forth. What he's doing in this 25th chapter, he's giving instructions to start building the temple, I mean the, the tabernacle, and he gives them the pattern of it. It's the same pattern that the temple will be built when Solomon builds the temple. The tabernacle is the same thing as the temple. It's a mobile temple in the wilderness. When the cloud moves, they're instructed to move. And they have a particular way of doing this. Now, we are down here in verse 9, one more time. <coughs> and he says, According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle, the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Thou shalt make an ark of shittim wood. Now, like I said last week, some of the writers believe that this was an incorruptible wood because it's going to be around in, these, in this furniture of the tabernacle for a thousand years. So it's going to have to be pretty long-lasting wood. Some say it's the acacia tree. Some say it's another form of tree that will not rot. I would think it would be the kind that wouldn't rot since this is uh, somewhere in the neighbor of 1400 B.C., 14. 
50 B.C. is approximate time period where he's telling them to build it. And it's going to be nearly a thousand years later when Nebuchadnezzar destroys the temple and carries off everything. It'll be in 586 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar comes in to destroy it. So it's going to be a considerable time later. He says, make an art of sheet and wood, two cubits and a half. That's, we've talked about the cubit being the length of the, the length from the elbow to the tip of the king's finger, which was approximately a foot and a half. And he says, and, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Thou shalt overlay, overlay it with pure gold, wherein it, it with pure gold, and where, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make it a crown of gold round about. So, we don't know, don't try to figure out what the ark of the Lord looks like. You're not going to be able to come up with exact figures. It's going to be a box, going to have some kind of a crown around it. And we're going to get to the fact that it's got a mercy seat and it sets up on a table. We don't know all about it. It's going to have a mercy seat and it's going to have these these cherubim with their wings stretching out and it's going to have one on both ends. So evidently they built it with the wings stretching out and the wings will stretch and touch the curtain walls on the sides. Well, I, I don't need to tell you more about that right now. Then he says, Thou shalt cast four rings of gold for this Ark of the Covenant and put them in the four corners thereof and two rings shall be in one side and two rings in the other side. So you're going to have rings. If you looked at it from the top, like so. you got rings, like so. They probably, I don't know if they move on a hinge, but they're going to be stable, and you, they're going to have staves. And he says, thou shalt, make, thou shalt cast four rings of gold, put them in the four corners, and two rings shall be in one side of it, and, four, and two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves. Staves are sticks. They're rods that will go through these rings. Like that, going through the ring, looking at it from the top. And these rods can never be taken out. These staves can never be taken out. That's how the Ark of the Covenant and all the furniture of the tabernacle is going to be transported. Now, and thou shalt make the staves of sheet and wood and overlay them with gold, and thou shalt put the staves in the rings by the sides of the Ark, that the ark may be borne by them, and the staves shall be in, in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken out. Let me write this up here. Staves. Let me just write it down. Staves. Permanent. Permanent. In rings. All right. I want you to notice down in verse 23. Thou shalt also make a table to set the ark upon of sheet and wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with the pure gold and make... Thereto a crown of gold round about, and thou shalt make unto it a border of a handbreadth round about, and thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about, and thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the feet, on the four feet thereof, over against the border 
shall the rings for places of the staves to bear the table where the ark sits. Thou shalt make the staves of sheet and wood and overlay them with gold and the table may be born with them. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof and the spoons thereof and covers thereof and bowls thereof to cover with all of pure gold shalt thou make them and thou shalt set Upon the table, the showbread before me. This is, excuse me, this is the table of showbread. So you got the table for showbread. I called it the table for the ark. But you got rings in that. And this is the showbread right here. Now this is, this is about us. We being many are one bread and one body. 1 Corinthians 10, 22. The prayers of the saints is on the altar of incense. That'll have rings in it. Remember we read last week that the Ark of the Covenant will be put in a bag with a ring on top of it, and it will be carried. No, the candlesticks. What did I say? Oh, the candlesticks. That's right. Excuse me. And the Ark of the Covenant will have rings, and they'll carry it. And the Bible, let's just read. Let me just recover some of the things that we read last week. Not all of the verses... Look at Numbers 3, and I'm just going to read a couple of verses here. Numbers 3. All right. Numbers, the third chapter, in verse 17, the sons of Levi, by their names, Gershon, Koath, and Merari, and then down here in verse 27, Koath was of the family of the Amramites. Amram was, here's Amram, the father of Aaron and Moses. And he's talking about these Koathites. Was the family of the Amramites and the family of the Izharites and the family of the Hebronites and the family of the Uziites. These are the family of all of the Koathites. Well, those were the sons of Koath. And then he goes on to say that the Korthites, their duty will be to carry all these, all of these furniture of the Ark of the Covenant, to carry them wherever they went. Now, there's going to be thousands of Korthites, so they're going to have plenty of them. It's not like you're going to have three or four. They'll have plenty of guys to carry, and if they get tired, some of these other guys can go over and carry for them, because they're going to have thousands of them. If they're walking through the wilderness and some of them are weighted down, they'll say, come over here and trade places with me and you carry a while. Then look over here in Numbers 4. Numbers 4. And verse 15. Verse 15. And when Aaron and his sons have made an end of covering the sanctuary... The previous verse is about covering all of, the, all of the furniture of the sanctuary for transport. When they're going to transport it somewhere, they gave the coverings here. Made an end of covering the sanctuary and all the vessels of the sanctuary as the camp is set forward. Set forward means to pick up and move. After that, the sons of Koath shall come to bear it. And they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. Very important. Corthites. Not touch. Any part of this furniture, what do they get to touch? The, polish. the staves, that's it. Nothing else. They, and they never take the staves out. They're permanent, right? All right. Show you how serious God is. Never touch. Now back over to number seven. Number seven. I'm giving you the high points of last week. Number seven. And I'm going to read a little bit of this. Verse 4, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take it of them that they may be, be to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt give them unto the Levites to every man according to his service. 
Now he's talking about all the sons of Levi, Kohath, Merari, and Gershon. Now he's going to limit what he does. Take it to them that they may be to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Thou shalt give them unto the Levites to every man according to his service. Moses took the wagons and the oxen and gave them unto the Levites, but not to all the Levites. Two wagons and four oxen he gave unto the sons of Gershon. Gershon. So Gershon got two wagons and four oxen. Two wagons. Four oxen. All right. Now, two wagons and four oxen, and four, ox four wagons and eight oxen he gave unto the sons of Merari. Four wagons and eight oxen. Four wagons, eight oxen. Now, Four wagons and eight oxen he gave unto the sons of Merari according unto their service under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. But unto the sons of Kohath he gave no wagons and no oxen. Why? They're not going to need them. They're going to carry all of their work on their shoulders with these staves, aren't they? At least they're supposed to. You reckon they're always going to do that? No, they're not. <laughs> lazy bums. When people don't want to keep the laws of God, they get lazy. I'm going to do this an easy way. But unto the sons of Korth, he gave no wagons and no oxen because the service of the sanctuary belongeth unto them was that they should bear everything upon their shoulders. No wagons. No wagons. To Kohath. Kohath got no wagons from God, did they? That was the title of one of my messages years ago. Now, they got no wagons. Now, remember... In Numbers 16, last week, Numbers 16, in verse 1, Kor the son of Izhar. Izhar was a Korthite, but he was not a son of Aaron, and you cannot do any work in the tabernacle unless you're a son of Aaron. And Korah says, I want to do the work of a priest offering incense and God killed there in that chapter he killed 250 men that came with Korah because they wanted to do the work of Aaron and Moses and they said you take too much on you and they begin to question God's preacher watch out when you start questioning the preacher of God God might get you if I'm telling the truth God's not a police officer walking the corridors of heaven to see who he can get. Yes, he is. <laughs> he certainly is. He's not just going to get you if you belong to him. He's going to beat you up and scourge every son he receives to cause you to be a partaker of his holiness. Now, the ark has to be carried on staves by Korthites, which are priests of God, but you have to be a son of Aaron to work in the temple but the Izharites, the Hebronites, the Uzielites, all of these guys, it is the sons of Aaron's duty to do all the religious ritual. You say, but I want to be a son of Aaron and do something important. Are you sure? Because if you're a son of Aaron and you make one mistake inside the temple... Nadab and Abihu, the first two sons of Aaron, they offered strange fire upon this altar of incense. 
I don't even know what the strange fire was. It could have been a mixture of the wrong incense. It could have been the fire that was mixed on this. You remember we talked about the spoons, the gold spoons, and, and all of these various utensils. They had to take a golden censer, a gold censer, and get fire from this altar out here and light this incense here. Some say the incense wasn't lit on the altar, that the altar was taken inside the sanctuary, and the censer that they gathered the fire off of here was, the censer was put in here, and the fire was lit upon this Ark of the Covenant, so the smoke would go up as a sweet-smelling savor to God, and it would blind the high priest that would go in there once a year, and he had to get face down, and when he got on his face, he couldn't look up because if he looked up and saw God, God would kill him right there on the spot. And some say that they would tie a rope around their leg just in case God killed him so they could drag him out. And if they drag him out, they'd say, okay, sons of Aaron, who's next? You really want to be a son of Aaron? That's dangerous. You do one thing wrong and you're dead. One thing. That's the rules of God. You don't touch any of this. You touch holy things, you'll die. Now, I want us to go over to 1 Samuel. I want us to look at the Ark of the Covenant. How is it to be born? Go to 1 Samuel, 3rd chapter. Now, there is a priest of God here. If he's a priest of God, if he's a priest of God, then he is a descendant of Aaron. There's a priest of God in this second chapter. His name is Eli. He's a descendant of Aaron. He's got two wicked sons. There's three sets of two wicked sons that I always think of. I think of Hophni and Phinehas here, which are sons of Eli. They do some evil stuff. And in the first chapter... There's a man here named Elkanah, and he's got two wives, one named Panenna, and the other is Hannah. Panenna's, boy, she's got having one baby after another, and she's fruitful, and Hannah doesn't have any babies. And she begins to cry out to the Lord and say, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you for your service. Well, how could she do that? unless her husband was a priest. Because Samuel, who's going to be born, couldn't be working in the... in. It's not a temple yet, but couldn't be working in association with Eli, the priest, unless he was a priest. Well, she prays. God gives her a child. She, she, her prayer is not answered in the sense... I prayed for a son and God gave him to me. She said, if you give me a son, I'll give him to you for service. She didn't say, you give me a son, I believe you're going to give it. That's not what she said. And a lot of times people question the meaning of the word prayer, which means to bow to the will of God. They'll say, well, Hannah prayed her prayer and she got what she wanted. She didn't ask for a son. She said, if you'll give me one, I'll give him back to you. And a son was born, his name was Samuel. Shamael heard. Remember, Shama is the word to hear, the hearing ear. The seeing eye of the Lord has made in both of them. Shama is the word hear, and it's the word obey. And El is the word Lord, so it means heard of the Lord. Well, she gives Samuel to God, takes him to Eli, the priest of God, who is in charge of the Ark of the Covenant at this point. There's no kings in Israel at this point. In fact, you can back up to the book of Judges. Uh, Ruth is right before this. You go back to the book of Judges, there in that last verse of the last chapter, this is not the only time this says it, but in those days there was no king in Israel Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So when you get to 1 Samuel, there's no king. You don't have a king until you get to the ninth chapter. The eighth chapter, the people say, give us a king. The ninth chapter, 
God picks out Saul to be the first king. Wrong tribe, tribe of Benjamin. Now, Eli has got two sons. And Elkanah, verse 11 of chapter 2, Elkanah, the father of Samuel, went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. Eli was a priest. He was a descendant of Aaron. Now, the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They were wicked. Hophni and Phinehas. Samuel had two wicked sons over there in that sixth chapter. Oh, excuse me, the eighth chapter. He's got one as Joel, the other is Abiah. He's not to be confused with the prophet Joel or Abiah, however you want to pronounce it. That was a common, those were common names then. Back to chapter 2. The sons of Eli were wicked. They knew not the Lord. So they're priests too, but they don't know God. And the priest's custom with the people was when they, any man offered sacrifice, the priest servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. You've heard me talk about this. They took a flesh hook. The priest ate whatever was being sacrificed that day, if it was lamb, if they were sanctifying the sanctuary by offering a young bullock, and they dipped down with his flesh hook, and what they pulled out was their meal because they were in a course. They would serve a week, two week in courses and that would be their course and while they were there they would eat the table, they'd eat the bread from the table of showbread and they would eat what was on the altar. That's why the altar was called the table of the Lord because that's where the priest would eat from with that flesh hook. And he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and all that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in shallow unto all the Israelites that came thither. Now these sons of Eli, they were wicked. So God says in verse 27 of chapter 2, we're still talking about the Ark of the Covenant being born on staves. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt, in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? So evidently this man must be Jesus. Uh, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me, and did I give unto the house of the father of offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and my offerings by your two sons, your wicked sons, Eli? Here's an illustration of what's going to happen when you got children, you don't raise them in the truth, and you don't teach them truth. Eli was taking care of the house of God, but he was failing to raise his children right. And he says, which have commanded in my habitation, honors thy sons above me by letting them do what they want to do, by taking bribes at the gate of the temple and probably messing around with the women, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of, the, of Israel, my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed, that thy house and the house of thy father would walk before me forever. And now the Lord said, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and them that despise me shall I lightly esteem. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house. What does he mean? I'm going to kill your two sons, two priests of God. And shall not be an old man in the, thine house because your sons are going to die. In verse 34. This shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons and on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest. Then you have chapter 3 where Samuel hears the call of the Lord. He hears the voice of the Lord and he thinks it's Eli calling him. He goes into Eli and said, you, did you call my name? He said, no. Go back to bed. 
and it happened several times. And then he, then Samuel comes in and says, somebody's calling me. He said, this is the Lord. And Eli called Samuel in verse 16 of chapter 3 and said, Samuel, my son, he answered, here am I. And he said, what is the thing that the Lord has said unto thee? Now, God comes and talks to Samuel prior to this, and we need to back up and look at that. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him in verse 7. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Samuel means heard of the Lord. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood and called at the, as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. He's just a young guy. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. Boy, we've heard that phrase many times, haven't we? In that day I will perform against Eli, the priest of God, <coughs> all things which I have spoken concerning his house where I'm going to kill his children. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth because his sons made themselves vile and he didn't restrain them. This is judgment. Don't think going to church is good enough. And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the door of the house of the Lord and Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is this thing that the Lord has said unto thee? I pray thee, don't hide it from me, Samuel. Samuel's young. Eli is old. I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee, and more so also if thou hide anything from me of all things that thou hast said unto me. And Samuel told him every whit and hid nothing from him and Eli said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. Whatever he does to me, and he kills my sons, it will be good. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And it, and. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Now, chapter 4. Israel goes at war with the Philistines. While they're at war, verse 11, the ark of God was taken. How is the ark supposed to be carried? By Kohathites on shoulders with those staves. Isn't that right? right? The ark of the God was taken, and the two sons of Eli and Hophni and Phinehas were slain. God has the Philistines kill them. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with earth on his head. And when he came to Eli, he sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled, for the ark of God was gone. The Ark of the Lord is the first piece of furniture that was built there in that 25th chapter of Exodus. It was God's abode. It was His throne. It's where He sat to rule Israel. The Ark of the Covenant, as long as they were obedient to God, they could take the Ark into the battle and they could beat all their enemies. That was their salvation was the Ark. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out, The Ark's gone! What are we going to do? And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in the hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old. Old man. 
But age is not going to kill him. And his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army as we fought the Philistines. And I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there have been a great slaughter among the people. And your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. Now, what do you think shocked Eli most about this? His son's dead? No. He was a priest of the Most High God. He knew that it was absolute devastating and destruction for the ark to be gone for Israel. And it came to pass when he had made mention of the ark of God that Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck break and he died. Didn't die of old age even though he's 98. For he was an old man and heavy and he had judged Israel 40 years. Now, I've got too much. I'd finish all this. We're going to cover all this verse by verse when we go through 1 Samuel. Let's go over to the fifth chapter. What do they do with the ark? The Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer, which means helping stone. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I'm come. This is mentioned twice in the New Testament here, in the Old Testament. It went from Ebenezer unto Ashdod, one of the capital cities of the Philistines. And when the Philistines took the ark of God, they bought, brought it into the house of Dagon, the fish god, and set the ark in the house of Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early in the morrow. Behold, Dagon was fallen upon the face to the earth, but for the ark of the Lord, their statue had fallen down before the ark because God put it down, face down. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. When they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen. Dagon comes from dog, which is the word fish. Dagon was the fish god, probably a deification of Noah. They took something righteous and made something unrighteous out of it. To the ground of the ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off from the threshold and only the stump of Dagon remained. Who's doing this? This is God doing this, isn't it? Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any of them that came into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod unto this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds. We don't know what emeralds are. Some say they're hemorrhoids. It was something bad enough to kill them. I've had the worst hemorrhoids in the world, and it didn't kill me. But I felt like I was dying. Best operation I ever had. even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the, when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, the ark of God of Israel is not going to stay here with us. Do you think they called for some Kohathites to carry the ark? No. For his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. And they sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, what are we going to do with this ark of the God of Israel? He's killing us with it. And they answered, Let the ark of God of Israel be carried about unto Gath. Get it over to one of our sister cities. Maybe they'll like it. Remember, Goliath was of Gath. He was a Philistine. Take it to Gath. Get it out of Ashdod. Now, what verse was I in? They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines and them said, what are we going to do with the ark? And they said, take it to Gath. And they carried the ark of God of Israel about thither, over to Gath. It was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. He smote the men of the city, 
both small and great, and they had emeralds in their secret parts. Therefore, they sent the ark of God to another Philistine city, to Ekron. That's real good, isn't it? Let's make our brothers suffer. And it came to pass, the ark of God came to Ekron, and the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought about the ark of God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go again to his own place, that it slay us not and our people. And there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men that died not were smitten with emeralds, and the cry of the sinning went up to heaven. Chapter 6, verse 1. The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months with all his suffering. And the Philistines called for the priest and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? They called their magicians. <laughs> Get it out of here. <coughs> Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his own place. And they said, If you send away the ark of the God, ark of God of Israel, don't send it away empty. Send five golden emeralds and five golden mice in verse four. Send a, an appeasement. Look at verse seven. We'll look at 6 and 7. Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? And when he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go and they departed? Now therefore, make a new cart. How's the Ark of the Covenant supposed to be carried? On staves by Kohathites. And take two milk kine on which thou hast come no yoke, and tie the kind to the cark and bring their calves home from them. And take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put the jewels of the gold which you returned from a trespass offering in a coffer by the side thereof and send it away that it may go. Well, they do all this. And they take it to Beth Shemesh in verse 12. And the kind took the straight way, the way up to Beth Shemesh, and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right hand or the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them unto the border of Beth Shemesh. And they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Now these Beth Shemesh is in Israel. But they do something wrong with it. And the cart came into the field of Joshua, Beth Shemite, and stood there where there was a great stone. And they claved the wood of the cart and offered the kind a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of God and the coffer that was with it, wherein the jewels of the gold were put in the great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. When the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. So they got it out of the Philistines and got it back to Israel. But Israel doesn't seem to know how to handle the ark of God. And these are the golden emeralds of the Philistines returned from the trespass offering unto the Lord for Ashdod one, Gaza one, for Ashkelon one, for Gath one, for Ekron one. Now, let's go down here, and let's look at 18. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, belonging to the five lords, both of the fence cities and of the country villages, even unto the great stone of Abel, wherein they set down the ark of the Lord, which stone remaineth unto this day in the field of Joshua the Beshemite. And God smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark. They wanted to go inside and see what was inside of it. There was an opening. It had a mercy seat on it. 
and we're going to find that God had already put the commandments written with the finger of God upon tables of stone inside the ark, and they wanted to look at it, and they didn't have any business looking at it. So God says, I'll just kill you for that. Israelites, this is the most holy thing in all the furniture of the temple. It's the most holy thing. It is the abode of God. It is his seat in his house. It is his throne. You don't play around with the throne of God. Now that's our hearts. People who want to mess with God's throne, which he sets inside his temple, which temple ye are. When you mess with God's believer, you can get in trouble. They wanted to look inside the ark of the Lord. Even he smote the people, 50,000 and three score and ten men. 50,000, three score, 60, 70. 50,070 men God killed because they looked inside the ark. Do you think God is serious about his laws? And these were Israelites. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God to whom shall he go up for us? And they sent messengers unto the inhabitants of Kerjath Jearim, saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come you down and fetch it up to you. Now, Kerjath Jearim is on the border. It's on the border of Benjamin, just here on the border of Benjamin, not far from Jerusalem. So they're going to have to get it over to Jerusalem where it belongs, aren't they? Let's go to the sixth chapter of Samuel, of Second Samuel. Sixth chapter of Second Samuel. Now you go through First Samuel. Saul is king, pursues David. Uh, then Saul dies at the end of. 1 Samuel, David becomes king over all of Israel. In 2 Samuel, David goes through all of his adventures in 2 Samuel. But before, before we get to David's adultery in the 11th chapter with Bathsheba, before we get to David's murder of Uriah the Hittite in that same chapter, we find David bringing the ark of the Lord back to Israel. How should it be brought back? It should be carried back on staves by Kohathites, shouldn't it? Well, let's see what happens. Chapter 6, 2 Samuel. And David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baale of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, and he lives between the cherubim. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. Do you think David knew better than that? How about the priests of God that are with it? Did they know better? We found out that they should know better, shouldn't they? If you've got a job, you should know what your duty is, especially if you're in the temple of God and God will kill you if you don't do it right. Remember, staves are permanent. Never touch any of the furniture of the ark, right? Lest you die. They start bringing it back to Jerusalem on a new cart. Wrong! And brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah, or Gibeah and Uzzah and Ahio the son of Abinadab, the priest of God, drove the ark. 
And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God and a heo, or a hio, however you want to pronounce it, went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments, rejoicing. They were happy. The ark's coming home where it belongs. It's been gone a long time. They played on played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps, on psalteries, and timbrels, and cornets, and on cymbals. When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it because the oxen shook it. What's the penalty for touching the ark? Die. You die. You touch the ark. It doesn't matter whether he wasn't thinking that day. People say, I just wasn't thinking. God will kill you then. When you're doing the service of God, you don't, well, I, I just kind of foolishly did that and I really wasn't thinking to the consequences. Well, then pay. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sought that shall he also reap. People don't understand, if you don't live right, you'll pay for it as a believer. You might pay for it, for it through your children. God may kill them to get your attention. And he took hold of it, for the oxen shook it, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against us. Uh, I don't care how innocent he looked that day. He knew. What do you do when the ark is falling on a shaky cart? You jump back and go, whoa, huh. I'm not touching that. No. You let it fall. Don't you? It should have had staves in it. And they had plenty of priests in Israel. And they should have been carrying it back, shouldn't they? But it just doesn't. God really doesn't mean what he says. And there's no consequences to it. Yes, there is. And he died. And David gets angry at God. David, are you crazy? David was kind of got off the wall sometimes, didn't he? Well, he took off and took Bathsheba and had a baby by her, and he died and and committed murder by killing her husband. You're either hit tight, and then he repented, and then God says, "Well, David, it doesn't matter. The sword will never leave your house." And then his his son Amnon rapes his daughter Tamar and Absalom his other son plots for two years to kill Amnon and he does and then Absalom tries to take over the kingdom and then Abishai David's nephew who's his commanding general kills his son Absalom and David weeps all the way to the grave David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah and he called the name of the place Perez as a breach upon us, but to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. I guess he should be because he got mad at God for doing something that he'd already set the law down. Is it okay to, do, to live and do what you want to do? No. And there's much more on this story about the ark. I, it was put into this one man's house and God blessed his house, but... You don't look inside the Ark of the Covenant. You sit back in a reverence to it. Of course, the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled with the blood, and our hearts are sprinkled, and our hearts are the Ark now. So men who would come up against God and touch Israel, spiritual Israel, the church, he says, you touch Israel, you touch the apple of my eye and my, my fury will come up in my face, and I'll be in a rage when you do that. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? You know how that's supposed to be, on staves. They shouldn't have ever been removed. So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him and to the city of David, but David carried it aside unto the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, 
Gittites were Philistines. Evidently, he was a good Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. But let me tell you, they backed off and looked at it and made sure nobody got near it, and they didn't touch it either. Is it okay just to live the way you want to? Now notice, how are you going to understand this chapter if you don't understand these chapters? You can't, can you? And I've heard people say, I wonder why God killed us. Well, you need to go back over and read Exodus, and you'll find out. Because he touched the ark of God when it was shaken about to fall. You jump away from that when it's falling. And look over. Now, I've told you this before. When you're studying First and Second Samuel, First, Second Samuel, this is about Saul. Saul is in First Samuel. He becomes king in the ninth chapter, the twelfth chapter. He gets his coronation, and. You have the same thing, and you get David is full is completely king in Second Samuel. Well, you have First Chronicles, which is a corresponding book to First and Second Samuel. You got the story of Saul and David in First Chronicles. This is from the priest's viewpoint. This is from the king's viewpoint. Let's go over to First Chronicles, the thirteenth chapter, and let's look at First Chronicles account. You have to read other accounts to see. How much time do I have, Mike? 22. All right. Let's go to First Chronicles. What did I say was going? I forgot. 13. Yeah, right. I just go blank once in a while. I've got too many things in my head. All right. First Chronicles 13. This is Chronicles' account of the same incident, David bringing it back. <clears throat> Always read the corresponding chapters. If you're reading Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, read the corresponding chapters, and usually it would be right there by, it'd be in the margin of your Bible. With the course, if you have a, a Thompson chain, it'll be in the margin of your Bible, the corresponding chapters. Now look here in chapter 13. And David consulted with the captains in thousands and hundreds with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good to you that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto to our brethren everywhere that are left in the land of Israel, and with them also of the priests and Levites, which are in the cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us. And let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. Because Saul was the king, and he was wicked and doing evil, even though he was a believer. And all the congregation said that they would do so. For the thing was right in the eyes of all the people to get the ark of God back. And David gathered all of Israel together from Shihor of Egypt, even unto the entering of Hamath, to bring the ark of God from Kerjath Jerem, which is where it was placed there when it was brought back from the Philistines on a cart. And they're going to bring it back on a new cart. I wonder if they got that lesson from the Philistines, just ignoring the word of God. Well, gosh, I forgot about that. It had to be carried on the staves. And David went up and all of Israel to Baala, that is, to Kerjath Jerem, which belonged to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God, the ark of God the Lord, that dwelleth between the cherubim, whose name is called on it. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart. They say that twice. Said it back there in the sixth chapter of Second Samuel. Out of the house of Abinadab in Gaza and Ahio drave the cart. And David and all of Israel played before the Lord God with all their might, and with singing and harps and psalters and timbrels and with cymbals and trumpets. And when they came unto the threshing floor of Kedon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark 
And there he died before God. Doesn't mean Uzzah was an unbeliever. It means he was rebellious. When it, being a son of a priest, he knew better. He's just going to save God to the problem of having to have the ark, have the ark of the Lord repaired. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and therefore that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to himself that day, but he carried it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, and the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. Now, let's go back over here to Exodus. Do you see the importance of understanding the book of Exodus? You're not going to know what's going on with David and Uzzah and the ark if you don't know something about the book of Exodus, are you? Not a thing. Now let's go back over there to... Now if you'll notice, the first thing that God builds is a place for himself to sit. Once the ark is... He's saying, build this, build this ark, put the rings in it, staves in it. And then he says, I need a place to sit. I need a throne in Israel. If you notice, the ark of the covenant and the mercy seat. The mercy seat was not, was not a part of the ark. It was separate. Let me show you this. Well, let's read verse 17. Huh? What chapter 25, Exodus. Chapter 25, Exodus. Well, verse 16 says, Thou shalt put into the ark of the testimony which I shall give thee. I want to tell you what I want in the ark of the testimony. You can look at Hebrews, the ninth chapter, and you can see what's inside the ark. This is why they were looking in the ark. Look over here in, in Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Hebrews 9. I want you to learn how to see the importance of the Old Testament. It is a description of us in the New because our hearts are the Ark of the Covenant. Our hearts are sprinkled. The law is written on fleshy tables of the heart in the third chapter of Second Corinthians. And I believe that when people touch the Ark of God, when they touch our hearts or our understanding, which is what, if our hearts are the Ark of the Covenant, which they are, but our heart, is, like I said, is not the, aorta and the right ventricle and the left ventricle and so forth. Our hearts are our understanding. When somebody touches our understanding and tries to twist our understanding, God will deal with people that touches his people. You have to be very careful about how you treat the people of God and the preacher of God and the truth of God. Now look here in Hebrews. Everything that we're studying is going to tie with the New Testament. With our hearts being sprinkled, uh, God sits upon the throne of our hearts. He says here in, in verse 8, the Holy Ghost this signifying, making plain is the word signifying, delao, D-E-L-O-O, -O, that the way into the Holy of Holies or the holiest of all was not made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. The way into this holy of holies by the blood of a goat on the tenth day of the seventh month was not plain while this was standing. But all this was blotted out. The, the, the handwriting of the literal temple was blotted out. Colossians 2.14. What's left is... We're the temple of God. Our hearts are the Ark of the Covenant. We're circumcised of the heart. Now he says here, in this chapter, 
Verse 1, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of a divine service and worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, the first tabernacle, which is this outer sanctuary here, and he tells you what was in the outer sanctuary. He says, First, wherein was the candlesticks, the table of showbread, which is called the sanctuary. This was out here. Now, he doesn't name this altar of incense because some say it was carried inside the Holy of Holies. But let's continue to read. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, he's naming what was inside here on the Day of Atonement. Some say the censer was put between the two cherubim and the incense was put on there and then fire was taken from this altar out here and taken in by the high priest on that tenth day of the seventh month. Which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. So you had the inside the ark was the commandments written on tables of stone, Aaron's rod that budded, and the, and the pot of manna. And this incense was, the altar was somewhere out here. They kept it out here through the year, but the golden censer was in here between the cherubim lit with the fire from this altar. Then he says, And over it the cherubims of the glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot speak, now speak particularly. Now, go back over here to Exodus 25. Verse 17, Thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. The mercy seat, I'm going to get into the mercy seat. I just don't have much time to have. I don't even have time to go there. I'll have to come back next week. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half. Remember, uh, a cubit was about a foot and a half. So two cubits and a half, that'd be at about three and three quarter feet shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubim, or cherubims, of gold, of beaten work, thou shalt make them in the two corners of the mercy seat. The two ends. Huh? The two ends. What verse was that? 18. 18. Shall make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. So the mercy seat, let me erase this over here. Now this is going to get a little complicated here. All right. You had... Here's the tabernacle here's the veil here's the ark of the covenant these the wings of those cherubim were supposed to touch the far side of the wall up to here these are wings I can't draw wings you'll just have to pretend you see that wings go all the way over to here now you got, these are called cherubim. But the Bible says there's four cherubim around the ark of God. Let's go over here to chapter 26. 26, verse 31. He's talking about the veil. The veil right here. This veil, some say it was about eight inches thick. Eight inches. When the veil of the temple was written in the midst when Jesus died, we go straight to God. This is the veil. Listen to this. 
Thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen of cunning work. With cherubim shall it be made. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. And thou shalt hang up the veil under tashes or hooks that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil of the within the veil the ark of the testimony and the veil shall be divided unto you between the holy place and the most holy and shall put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place and thou shalt set the table outside the veil and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the ta- on the side of the tabernacle toward the south and thou shalt put the table on the north side. If y'all notice, I always show the table up here, don't I? I always show the candlesticks down here. That's because the Bible says so. I didn't make that up, in case you thought I did. Now, he says, I'm going to have cherubim here, one here. These are going to be em- braided or woven into this veil here. There's going to be two of them looking down upon the Ark of the Covenant. You can have one on each end of the Ark of the Covenant. This is what he's talking about. Go to Revelation, the fourth chapter. These are the cherubim, and I don't have time to get into this. This is a long, 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 long study, fourth chapter. How much time do I have? Six minutes. Boy, I hate to go into this because, man, this will take all night. All right. Here's a description of the spiritual tabernacle. It is after the pattern of the literal tabernacle. It's a picture of us. It's a picture of us. All right, just for the sake of viewing, think, this is us right here. We're the temple of God. Here's the veil. The Bible says we enter in by a new and living way through the veil. That is to say his flesh. So the veil is his flesh. Well, if this is the house of God, then his flesh is us. This is his flesh here. And he says, I'm not going to live with a harlot of Babylon inside of you. You got to clean your life up. The veil is his flesh. The flesh is the bread. The bread is the body. The body is the church. So inside here is the church. The house of God. Of God. There's our hearts. The Ark of the Covenant that is sprinkled with the blood of Christ. We're elected unto obedience and the sprinkling of blood. Look here. And this I looked and behold, verse 1 of chapter 4 of Revelation. Behold, a door was open in the heaven. Now we've said that the heaven is a term for Israel, the ruling class. And the first voice which I heard was it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, Come up hither, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in Israel, or in the heavens. This is God's throne. That's our hearts. A throne is set in the heavens, and one sat on the throne. That's talking about the ark. That's talking about our hearts. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, and the sight likened to an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders. Of course, around the literal throne over here was the twenty-four sons of Aaron, by Eliezer and Ithamar. 
Now, let's keep reading. And I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Well, we look over in that 28th chapter of, of Exodus, and the priests of God wore crowns of gold upon their foreheads that said, Holiness to the Lord. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and we can't understand that unless you were there as a high priest going inside that holy of holies. Boy, it must have been a frightening place. And there were seven lamps of fire burning in front of the throne. Here's the throne. There's the lamps right there the seven candlesticks. Seven lamps burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So they're the seven spirits over here. Seven spirits. And you back up to the first chapter. In verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand in verse 16 Christ is standing amidst the seven candlesticks in this chapter and he's got seven stars and he says the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels, are messengers and from the messenger comes the Spirit of God and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Now back over here to chapter Chapter 4. And out of the seven spirits of God, and before the throne, there was a sea of glass. Right here. It's called a sea in 1 Kings, the seventh chapter. And the reason it's called a sea of glass is because Moses told all the women there in the 38th chapter of Exodus, to bring their looking glasses, which they were made of bronze, or it was a reflecting metal. They, didn't, they had not developed mirrors like we have today. They polished up metal, and the women would polish their faces and take care of their vanity by looking in their brass mirrors. And Moses tells them in that 38th chapter of Exodus to bring your glasses so we can make this glassy sea. It's a glassy sea over here. Over here, it's a washing in the blood of Christ because all of the priests would wash in that sea every morning before they went to offer any sacrifices here. And after they washed in the sea, they'd offer sacrifice, they'd come back and wash their hands and feet after each sacrifice through the day. That's where hand washing of the Pharisees and the foot washing of these primitive Baptists come from. Now, he says, there was a, there's a, before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. In the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts. Not evil beasts, but four cherubim. You see that? Four cherubim. The cherubim were, I've said it before, but if you have a McClinican Strong, you look up cherubim, you see those, you see those Assyrian cherubim, you can call them cherubim, and they believe that when Israel went in captivity by the Assyrians, that the Assyrians stole the cherubim of Israel or stole the idea and started coming up with, with these things called cherubim, except they modified it. Here they are right here. They modified it. Those are the Assyrian cherubim. 
chariots believe they stole this from Israel. And we don't know exactly what those cher cherubim or cherubim were uh, on the end of the Ark of the Covenant or woven inside the, uh, uh, the two of them in the, uh, in the veil. I got too many things on my mind. Am I out of time? This is going to take us back, and you see these four cherubim, and each one of them has the face of an eagle, the face of an ox, the face of a lion, and the face of man. And those are the four that God established his covenant with when Noah came out of the ark. Same covenant. He formed a covenant with the fowl of the air, the king of the fowl of the eagle, with the beast of the field, the king of the beasts is the lion. The cattle of the field, the king of the cattle is the ox and man. So when you see the four cherubim, this is very abstract terminology. You see in the New Testament, the cherubim of God are just simply a promise of God's covenant to protect his people. That's what it's about. So that's what these over here are about. They're about our protection over here. Not that there's literally cherubim flying around somewhere. Most people think cherubim are little bitty baby angels with little tiny wings and flopping around, flying around in the air. That's not what they are. And we'll get further into this. I hope you're beginning to see the shadows and the images, how they match up if people will listen to this series on Old Testament you'll learn a lot in it I can't run through this fast I wish I could well let's pray Father we thank you for truth thank you for your word it causes us to continue this work strengthen the sheep cause them to mature in the faith Lord, lead us to your family, your elect people. Open up many doors for the ministry. And Lord, fight our battles. Lord, I get tired and weary. I don't feel like fighting ever again. We'll give you praise for all things in Christ's name. Amen.